Hello, viewers. I'm here with Ian, editor chief at Acoustics. Hi, Ian. Hey, Taryn. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks. How are you doing? Um, well, it was a long ten days prior to today. Uh, college tours, industry events. Uh, spent thirty hours driving last week. So, oh, wow. uh, the, the, the 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 drained look in my face is the fact that I've been working nonstop since I got back from visiting colleges in the Northeast U.S. with my middle child and. I want to talk about floor standing speakers today, below a thousand pounds. And I'm going to structure things a little bit differently because even though I'm familiar with quite a few, we've heard them in different settings, I realized I haven't actually reviewed any sub 1,000 pound floor standing speakers. So, and I know that we've discussed our picks, myself and Ian, and I know that there's a couple of things on there that the ones that I'd have chosen anyway on my shortlist. So I'm going to structure it a little bit differently in the sense that I'll do it as an interview style. And I just really want to pick your brain in. You've got a lot of experience. You've owned a lot of these speakers in this market segment. You still do. Them. Yeah. Oh, well, wow. yeah. And um, so as someone who's an industry veteran, am I allowed to call you that? That makes me sound very old. <laughs> you know, and I feel <laughs> old recently. I feel very old recently, but okay. um, yeah, I'll, I'll take veteran. That's fine. Okay. All right. As someone who's very experienced in the industry and has a lot more, I just want to pick your brain about this segment, what you like, what you don't like, and just share my own experiences of, you know, which is much more limited with the speakers in there. So yeah, let's get cracking, shall we? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the reason why floor standing speakers are more popular in North America than say in Great Britain or even, you know, in, in the EU, it's, I think number one, it's the space element. I think uh, people in North America tend to have larger dens or living rooms or media rooms. And, you know, that gives people, you know, the ability to, you know, place a big pair of floor standing speakers in the middle of a room and pull them out three or four feet. As much as I love bookshelf speakers, and you and I are on the same page on this one, um, I still like a, an affordable floor standing speaker. And yeah. I think what's changed in the last five to 10 years is that the quality of affordable floor standing speakers has gone up a lot. And, you know, over the years, I mean, I owned three or four really large pairs of Martin Logan electrostats, but I mean, but they were enormous and, and they were domestically not very popular. Over the years, I've had to kind of like, I guess, go back to the beginning and look for floor standing speakers that are relatively either two way or three way at most. And, yeah. you know, and, and, and they had to be speakers also that, with the exception of the Maggie's, speakers that had to kind of fit into most domestic sort of environments, you know, rather easily. Um, and also, I mean, one of the advantages to having bookshelf speakers was the fact that, you know, I didn't have a dog. And you know, I didn't have to worry about, you know, uh, a dog running up to a pair of floor standing speakers and scratching them or licking them or eating them. But of course, but of course, during the pandemic, that changed. So, you know, I've, I've had to train my dog, young, young Tyrion. Oh, I've had to trade, I have to trade Tyrion to, you know, not eat, you know, eat my speakers. Don't eat the and, speakers, Tyrion. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. He, he doesn't listen. Westies don't listen to, to anybody. Um, but, 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 but that's also like one of the appeals of bookshelf speakers is that you can obviously, you know, keep them off the floor. Um, or if you have them on stands, obviously that, I mean, I don't care if the dog is licking the stand, but. You know, floor standing speakers, you have to be a little more mindful when you have little children. You have yeah. to be a little more, it could be especially because I have three kids. And at one point, obviously, I had babies, you know, lying on the floor, you know, playing with toys. And there were big speakers around them. And that was something that actually made me move towards bookshelf speakers at one point was that I did not want to have a big pair of floor standing speakers that could topple over onto a child. Um, also, I just think floor standing speakers actually look nicer in most domestic spaces. Um, as much as I like, you know, bookshelf speakers, th there's something about a pair of like 36 to 40 inch tall floor standing speakers that you can pull pull two to three feet out into the room. They become a piece of furniture in the room. Like they, they almost become a focal point for people. I think you're very right. The priorities here, uh, I think, are, are quite often different. I, you know, I think we have smaller rooms. We also need to temp sometimes be, so we're close to the speakers, typically two to three meters. What well. Right. You know what's that six to nine feet uh most people are probably you know around that distance where stand mount speakers two way simple two way stand mount works quite well from that kind of distance and also if you've got a floor standing speaker that needs a little bit uh, more space to breathe because it produces more bass and you have to yeah. put it out into the room that tends to be a 
consideration. So we tend to have them probably a bit closer to the walls as well. It's interesting what's happening in the home theater space. There's one group of people who will only buy a sound bar, but then there's other people who are kind of getting into the whole 2.1, 3.1 home theater setup. And for a lot of people, you know, getting a pair of, you know, relatively large floor standing speakers as their left, right speakers, you know, has a lot of appeal because it gives them a more full range sound and it can handle the, the, the dynamics, you know, of a movie score better. And, you know, and people, because a lot, a lot of people in North America, at least, you know, will place a media unit or credenza underneath their television. You know, they like the idea of having the speakers pulled out just enough from the wall that they're almost flush with the front of the media cabinet. It makes a very nice looking aesthetic in the room. But, but for me also in the U S I mean, I can't speak for British prices, but there's a lot of affordable, floor standing speakers now from a lot of brands. My favorite actually will surprise you. The Q Acoustics 3050i, it's one of those speakers that has flown under the radar for years. And there are very yeah. few reviews of it. And the truth of the matter is, I mean, when it came out, I don't. I think in Britain, you, you could buy it for five or 600 pounds when it came out. It's official retail price in the UK is around six, 700 pounds, but it's regularly yeah. on sale for less than okay. 500, less than pounds, 500. Yeah. I know. And I know it's more expensive in the US, but it's actually- Yeah, it's gone up. It's gone up in the last 12 months. Well, I just looked just before we went on and there were like a whole bunch of retailers retailing it here at the moment for less than 500 quid. Yeah, that's an unbelievable deal for those. Yeah, Other than the slightly wonky feet at the bottom, over the years, I find that the feet are not as inert as they were when I first bought them. The 3050i can be a very large sounding pair of loudspeakers. I mean, it's, it's really a two-way and- they're super easy to drive. I mean, I, I, I've driven the 3050i with like five and six watt tube amplifiers and sounded great. Wow. In fact, the amplifier I just shipped back this morning was a Unison Research tw Trio 25 tube integrated amplifier made in Italy. It sounded unbelievable with the speaker. It was you know tw it was 25 watts using the, in the triode mode, and I think it's 40 something in pento. Um, just amazing combination. But um, over the years, I've used it with my Croft integrated. I've used it with the NAD 316 BE V2. I've used it with the name Unity Atom, the Rotel 14 Mark II. I've pretty much almost, everything I've reviewed in terms of amplifiers in the last two years have gone through the, the 3050i. And almost nothing was bad. Actually, the Audio Lab 6000A is an excellent amplifier to use, use with the uh, 3050i. The only thing you have to know about the speakers, though, is that they can be very dull sounding. Yeah. Um, I remember when I first reviewed it, people wrote wrote to me behind the scenes and said, it's a nice speaker for the money, but it has no personality and the treble is very restrained. Okay. All of that is true. All of that is true. Yeah. But if you use the right amplifier with it, it can be a very, very pleasant sounding loudspeaker with almost every genre of music. And, and and the fact that I can drive it with a $490 NAD integrated and use that on a daily basis and not feel the need to upgrade should, you know, say something about that speaker. It's it's, it's really an undervalued speaker. Yeah, that's, that's a speaker that I've heard a lot of times. It's quite, that's one floor standing speaker, sub 1,000 pounds, that's actually quite popular in the UK because there's a couple of retailers that sell quite a lot known for shifting boxes, richer sounds and seven yeah. oaks. They, they're kind of quite big retailers and they're, it's quite prominent in their, in their kind of makeup of what they sell. And I think a lot of people, like you said earlier, use those for home cinema cross kind of yeah. two channel duties. My impression of it always has been, and like I said, it's probably good half a dozen times I've heard it is that it's got very strong kind of bass performance. Yeah, it does. Re reasonably well defined. Normally, they sound, you know, the speakers sound very boxy and kind of boomy. boomy. But it's yeah. got quite good bass definition. Not the last word in terms of the de detail centric audio no. file and a little bit no. rolled off on top. So, yeah, it depends on what kind of sound you want. But like I said, I've heard it with Audio Lab, I've heard it with NAD stuff, and it's always sounded good. On the flip side of this would be the Magnapan LRS. Magnapan have a new version of the LRS called the LRS Plus. But I'm not going to talk about that speaker because, quite frankly, I've yet to hear it. Um, Magnapan has not been very forthcoming about what the actual changes are in the speaker. And it's almost $250 to $300 more than the stock LRS. 
How so, much is the how much is the LRS in the well, US? Well, I paid six fifty for mine when I bought it two years ago, right. and I, I think it may have gone up a little bit, but still at, at its price, yeah, nothing nothing comes close to it. it it's yeah. th that, that's the thing. If you've never heard a pair of uh, MagnaPan lat speakers, you know, planar speakers, um, they're not quite as see through or cerebral as a pair of electrostats. You know, there's definitely a little more body to the sound. Um, I would say actually, but the LRS is not the warmest of all the MagnaPan speakers that I've heard heard over the years. But it's just it's so clean, and 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 it's just the, the, there's like if you get the amplifier right, and we'll talk about that in a second. They have so much presence in the room, and you can't even believe that this is a six hundred fifty dollars speaker. I mean, I've had, I mean, I believe you'll laugh, but I drive the Maggie LRS with my Cambridge Edge A which is a $6,500 integrated driving a $650 speaker. And I have to tell you, at no time does the MagnaPan embarrass itself. Like it's, you, you need an amplifier that has a lot of current. Right. And it's just, uh, people confuse the power and current thing in regard to Maggie's. Um, and people are like, well, my AVR can, you know, do 150 watts into four ohms. Very few watts, really, very few AVRs really do that into four ohms. And, you know, just because they're doubling their output, you know, in, into a lower impedance really doesn't really tell the whole story. Um, no, it's manipulated at what level yeah, of distortion, yeah. how many channels driven, et cetera, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. So Maggie's, Maggie's sound really, really well with uh, Bryston. They sound really nicely with Emotiva, Cambridge Audio, NAD. NAD is a great combination um, with uh, MagnaPan, but, what, but what not... Kind of what not kind of not MD? not the streaming amplifiers. No, like, I tried the 316 BEE and didn't like it. Didn't didn't have it. But some of the larger NAD receivers from the past that really you know output a lot of power, they can drive the mag. Old Adcom, vintage audio people who are into Adcom, that's a good combination. Past Labs, if you have that kind of money is a fantastic combination with MagnaPan. Like it's one of the best systems I've ever heard were past labs with, uh, with MagnaPan. But in the case of the LRS, I mean, they don't really have a lot of bass. And, and you kind of know that going in, because I think some people look at the speaker when they take it out of the packaging and they see such a large panel and they think, oh, wow, like the speaker is going to put out a lot of bass. It doesn't be, 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 because the ribbon Not itself is, driver. yeah, and, and it, the ribbon just doesn't have the output. I mean, you need a pair of really large Maggie's, like the, either the 3.7 or up, you know, to get really a lot of bass out of a pair of Maggie's. And, you know, and, you know, people try to integrate subwoofers um, with Maggie's. MagnaPan makes its own kind of subwoofer that is very different. I've used rail subwoofers with MagnaPan in the past. Very hard to get kind of the two speakers properly aligned. Um, the rail subs do a decent job on the speed side because panel speakers are very, very, very fast sounding. And, you know, so you need a subwoofer that can kind of keep up with that. Um, and rail's okay with it. I mean, I, I don't think it's perfect, but it's okay. Um, and also setup with these is very different than conventional dynamic loudspeakers. So when you set up a pair of Maggie's, you have to remember that they need space, space to breathe. And I have my LRS almost four feet from the wall, you know, behind them. And they're also almost three and a half, close to, they're not quite four, but three and a half feet from the sidewalls. But to get Maggie's to work properly, you have to actually push the tweeter past part of the panel actually further away. And so the angle at which, and the thing with the LRS is that you can set them up in different ways. You can have the tweeters on the outside, or you can have the tweeters on the inside, depending on how you, you know, which panel you put on which side of the room. How does um, it work? Is it is it like that a certain portion of the rib, ribbon is dedicated to the higher frequency? High frequency yes, yeah. Okay. So you actually, the way I have mine set up, the panel is actually turned about one and a half inches inward so that the outside part of the panel is actually hitting my ear first. The sound from that's hitting my ear first. And it looks a little awkward when you look at it from the side. I remember when I first set them off, my wife was like, you know, why are you turning them so awkwardly inward? And I said, well, we'll listen both ways and you'll hear the difference. And it's just, it's, you get a much better balance. And, and, the high, and the high sound sort of more in sync with the mid range and the bass. It's a very good speaker. 
So my impression of the LRS, so I, I think I've heard it briefly at a show once, if not twice. And what it's known for, the reputation is that it's demanding of partnering equipment because it's a very resolving speaker. So even though it's relatively inexpensive compared to, say, uh, some other panel speakers, it's not something that you can get away with putting relatively low quality amplification no, sources. With. not at all. And um, so that's the reputation that it has. The other thing, I think it doesn't sell particularly well in the UK. I don't know who distributes them, but they are. I, look, I looked it up. They're about a thousand pounds. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that yeah, actually, it, that, that's actually a topic I discussed with Ken Kessler going back right. a number, number of months ago because Ken did, I think, the Hi-Fi News review of the LRS. And as much as he loved them, you know, the price difference between North America and the UK was enormous. Like, I mean, in fact, I think even now, if you look at the prices now in 2022, I think it's even gone up another 100 or 200 pounds. So the, the, all of a sudden, what was a great deal at $650 US is suddenly like a 1,200 pound loudspeaker in the UK. And there's a lot of options at 1,200 pounds, you know, that might be better. So, And the other problem is the space, as we said, you know, right. the space, yeah. you know, the, because it's a panel speaker, it does need a bit more, you need to stick it in, it takes up. A little bit more space because it's quite wide compared to a, you know say a standard two-way bookshelf and you're sticking it you know three four feet into the room yeah and also the the stock feet suck and, right. and i'm sure wendell diller will, will be happy that i said it like that but um they do suck and they have these weird little bars um at the bottom of the feet that you turn sort of inward to so also tilt the speaker up a little bit and they're the most unstable things I've ever seen. I have no, I mean, there is someone based, some accountant basically came up with, came up with those feet to, to save 30 or 40 cents per speaker. Um, I do know that on the LRS plus, there is going to be a new dedicated stand option. And I think the reason why Magnapan finally did that was that there's a company in the U S that creates something called the Magnarizer. And I've written right. about it. It's actually on the acoustics website. I, I've written a story about it. It's a company in the U S that actually makes dedicated stands for every Maggie uh, currently in production and they make right. different versions of it. So not only is it a more inert stand that holds onto the panel, you know, in a, in a much more forceful way, but it actually lifts the speakers off the ground and it also keeps them completely vertical. Um, right. So it's, a, it's, a, and so it's a very, very different setup. And I have heard them not with the LRS. I've heard them with other speak with other Maggie's, and there's a, a pretty big improvement in focus and a pretty big improvement actually in the mid-bass performance. Everything's sort of punchier and tighter. Yeah, so what's your impression of what a good panel speaker like an LRS does well compared to a good conventional, say, you know, uh, box speaker? Uh, and what far more, mean? far more, like I would say it's far, there's a lot more presence. You know, okay. um, it, it just, it, it also, it creates a much larger sounding sort of sound stage, at least in my room. Okay. And, you know, and it has somewhat more of a see-through quality, um, different, somewhat, somewhat similar to an electrostat, but I just find the Maggie's have a little more meat to them. Right. And, and also unlike the Mag the, unlike the Martin Logans of today that have integrated a driver on the bottom with the electrostatic panel, the Maggie's, you know, are basically, you know, it's a series of ribbon panels. Like they're the, they're the, there's no dynamic cone driver to kind of, you know, augment, you know, I guess the base past a certain point. Um, yeah. They're very fast. Ribbon drivers are exceptionally fast. And the, the detail can be, uh, I don't want to say that the detail is that much better than a really good, you know, typical soft dome tweeter or a beryllium tweeter, but it definitely sounds very open, very spacious. Um, I, I find that vocalists sound, at least in my room, vocalists sound sort of a little more focused in the middle of the room, a little more firmly planted on the ground. And I can close my eyes and I really do envision that someone's sitting in front of me and singing. So right. I, I find it's, it's okay. So I guess holographic would be the, right. the, the proper terminology.